so it's supposed to return some value. Um, um, that's going to be non-negative. Um, so the, this is a scalar value, and this is um, between zero and, and infinity. Um, so well, um, and so um, the choice of your distance. Um, so the, uh, one of the key points of structure is that when you choose a distance, it's really a um, modeling choice. It's not something that's set in stone. You know that you know in order to solve the problem, you must optimize this particular distance. There are lots of choices of distances, and there's not one um, right distance and one wrong right distance. Um, so uh, so when you're doing you're trying to solve some problem for a particular distance. Don't, you know, put too much faith in that exact distance. Right? Um, um, so, but if you have two, if you have two objects, um, um, let's say two points. Let's say um, this is this point is at um, two three. That's two three, and this point is at. Um, Let's make this easy for myself. Seven, six. Right. Let's, let's do this. Uh, six, six, six. Okay. Um. <laughs> um so, um, what's the distance between these two points? Um, five, right? So I hear a lot of people saying five. What you can do is you can write um, um, if you're measuring the um, Euclidean distance, then um, you have d of let's call this a and b. A b equals square root of um, six minus two squared plus six minus three squared, this is equal to square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared, and there's, this is equal to 5 if you work it out. Um, so, but this is not the only distance between these two points. What are other possible distances that you could have? Yeah, Manhattan distance. Right, so, the, so another distance can be known as, um, is known as the Manhattan distance, which would be if you can only walk um, along the axes, right? So you walk along the axes and you sum up the lengths of um, this along these axes, right? And then this distance is going to be um, 4 plus 3, and so, the, so then the Manhattan distance is 7 instead of 5, right? Um, yeah, but this is not the only way to define this distance. There's also um, there are also other ways to define this distance, right? Um, so if you look at what's called the L uh, um, at the L infinity distance, then the distance is four. It's the maximum on this along every axis, right? Um, so th these distances are going to have on different properties, and so the, um, the the Euclidean distance has a nice property that if you um, if you rotate the space, it stays the same. But in other ways, the um, the L1 distance, um, which is this Manhattan distance, which I'll go through a bit more formally in a second, it is going to be more robust to errors, um, or to you know it's more stable in some sense. Um, and it's not really the distance you want. Often you want what's called the L0 distance, um, but the L0 distance is hard to actually, um, it's hard to work with because it's not convex. Um, so th th there, are these th there are these different ways you, um, 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 that you can find distance. Um, so one um, special class of distances is known as a metric. Um, the metric has um, four properties which are um, generally good things to happen at distance, right? So who knows 
um, what are the properties of a metric? Um, so, so who's heard the term metric before? Right, so, and who's not heard the term metric? Right, okay. So, so other people have heard the term metric. Who knows the properties of the metric? Now, if you raise your hand, I can call on you and ask you. <laughs> you're, you're not as likely to raise your hand. It's easy to say you've heard of that, right? Oh, what? Satisfy the triangle principle. Okay, the triangle equality. All right. There are four properties. The, the last property is the triangle inequality. And this means that D of A, C is always less than or, or equal to D of A, B plus D of B, C. Okay, so the easy way to see this, you draw a triangle between three points. That's why it's called the triangle inequality. And let's say I want the distance between A and B. This is always shorter to go directly to B than it is to go through any other point C. So if, if, if you're just looking at the Euclidean distance, right, it's always going to be longer to go through this detour to C. This could be equal, this could be equal here if C is exactly on this one. Now, not all distances actually um, satisfy the triangle inequality. And they can still be useful even if they don't. Um, but it's, it's a very convenient property to have. Especially if you think of, if you think the distance between A and B is the shortest distance the, the distance between them is, would be somehow shorter if you took a detour <coughs> to see. That's what you would need in order to violate the triangle inequality. You'd have to take some weird um, detour uh, um, in order to make the distance, um, um, in order, if you took a detour, you can make the distance small, which seems kind of strange. Um, well, but there are um, these weird phenomena that happen where you can you, you can think of your your like taking a detour and it actually makes the distance smaller. Like um, there's this weird paradox in um, how you study traffic uh, uh, um, called Arrow's paradox, where if you can add in a little piece of a road and it actually slows down the overall traffic, right? Um, because uh, you know people tend to take the shortest path and then there's more congestion, right? There's a class of of distances. Um, uh, um, called Bregman divergences, which don't satisfy the triangle inequality. Um, so, um, but they're still uh, very useful distances. They they capture a lot of um, statistical properties, um, and they, and they work better in like the space of um, distributions. They they make more sense from some um, statistical standpoint. They do some like measure um, um, the difference in the energy. <coughs> of the systems, but they don't satisfy the triangle inequality. Um, so this is not necessary for a distance, but it's a very intuitive property to have, and it'll make a lot of the techniques that we'll want to use distances for work, where if you don't have this, then you know all sorts of weird things start to happen. Um, OK, so even if you don't, yep? So for the detour, you said if you make the detour, then is the distance shorter, or is it more efficient? Well, so. It's the, the the way you define the distance is still on the direct path, I guess, from A to B. Yeah. Um, but if you added the distance from A to C and C to B, it would be shorter than than just going straight from A to B. Um, so let's travel more. But if you talk about like traffic and the G, then that means you're going a longer path to get there faster. So that might translate in terms of efficiency that it's more efficient to take the longer path. But they will be traveling more. Yeah, right. So, so the, uh, there's this cool there, there's this cool thing that happened. There's this cool trick in statistics where, well, I'm not sure what the area is, but um, the, there's this uh, example where there's these two baseball players. Um, and, and you look at the averages of the baseball player, so how many how many times they get it, what fraction of times they get a hit. Player A has a higher average in both halves of the season, 
but player B has the higher average for the entire season, right? Um, so this is this weird, weird thing. So, so you have player A, you know, has a in 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 half half one and two. In the first half, he goes. He has one hit out of one plate appearance. In the second half, he has four hits out of five plate appearances. Um, or, let's see if I get this right. Let's see. He's going to have, uh, let's say, three hits out of four. Just trying to make the numbers easy. He's 199 hits out of, say, He has 99 out of um, 299 he, he, he bats 299 times and he has 99 hits. So his total average will be 100 out of 300, which is one third. Um, player B, in the first half of the season, he's going to hit something like um, Let's say he also has 300 plate appearances. He hits has, has 200 hits out of 300, and in, this, in the second half, he only has 100 at bats, and he only has um, 10 hits. Right. So his total is 210 out of 300, and this is you know um, is is greater than two thirds. So player A, you know, has a batting average of 100 in the first half and about one third in the second half. So you say about 300, and then in the in the in and this guy bats two thirds in the first half has way more at bats and has fewer at bats in the in the second half and a lower average. But you know, overall, the player B has a higher average. And so this happened very famously in one season where there was a guy who like, got injured in one half of the season and only had a few at-bats and did well. Um, and, did, um, and he did okay in the second half of the season, but, um, but not as well as another guy. Um, or but slightly worse than another guy, but he had fewer at-bats that second half of the season. And the averages worked out this way. Um, so this is kind of a, kind of, if you looked at, um, it's, it's not quite the same thing as this triangle inequality is violated, but it's the same uh, um, um, sort of phenomenon that's happening here. Just the, just because it's, it's not always, you know, the, 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 the full thing is not always the sum of the two parts, right? Um, so that was a, um, so that was a bit of a um, digression. So let's okay. Um, what are other properties that you'd want in a distance? Positive. Uh, it's positive. Okay. So d of a b is going to be greater or equal than zero, right? So it's always um, um, non-negativity. Uh, So this is good, yeah? Right. Uh, um, symmetry. Um, is equal to distance from B to A, right? So if you compute the distance one way, it's, it's the same as the distance going the other way. So, so this is not necessarily true if you're driving, right? If you're driving, taking a left-hand turn may end up costing, taking more time than a right-hand turn, or some streets are one way. So when we're looking at distances on graphs, if the graphs are directed, you know, this can be really, um, it's, it's possibly violent. Okay. okay, so who's got to guess the last property? 
so um, so d of the distance from an object to itself is equal to zero, or, or actually we say is d of a d of a b is equal to zero if and only if a is equal to b. This is called identity. Right, so the, a, a distance is, is only zero if you're comparing it to itself. You can't have two things which are different, which, are, which have the same distance to each other. So if it satisfies all four of these properties, uh, um, that's called a the metric. There are some, so <laughs> there are a couple of like, things that aren't metrics. You can say a um, pseudo metric. Is is when you have a um, let's see if I get this right a c and d um, but does not have b so you can have a, a pseudometric can have two things which are not exactly the same but the distance between them is equal to zero and I'll talk about later today a uh, very useful pseudometric and these are. These are usually interesting when you want to take the scale of something or the magnitude of something out of the equation. Um, and then the other is a um, quasi um, metric. So these, um, this term pseudo and quasi, you know, mean it's it's kind of like. Um, it's um, um, kind of like a metric. Um, and the choice of pseudo for this one and quasi for this one, I think, was arbitrary. Someone claimed one of these names first, and then you know, the other person only had the other one left over. Uh, so, so, so this one is A satisfies A, B, and D. Right? And I, I guess you could have one where you had Maybe B, C, and D. I'm not sure if that would make sense, but they'd have to come up with a, just some third term to describe that. Um, so, so if you have A, B, and D, you have that it's not negative, it's zero only if they're the same, but it doesn't have uh, uh, um, the symmetry property. Right? Um, but so it has the triangle equal. So you can't take shortcuts, but you don't have this property of, of symmetry. So the, the most common example like this is if you're dealing with, um, if, you're, if you're driving, the, 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 the time it takes is always non-negative. You can't have negative time to get someplace. The, um, it's only zero if you're going to the place, the time is, if you're, if you're going to the place uh, um, that you already are, and the triangle quality still holds, you can't take shortcuts. The distance is the distance of the shortest path. Right, so you can't possibly violate that, but the symmetry property doesn't hold. It takes me, you know, about two minutes longer to get to my house going home than it does to get here in the morning because I have to make more left turns. Um, so, so you can have these pseudo and quasi metrics, and they're still useful. So when you lose one of these properties, it, it kind of takes away a class of, of algorithms that you can use on these on these distances. So it's important to keep in mind the, the, the properties that you have, and, and this will, um, you know, this will influence whether you want to use one of these distances or um, a different distance. Um, so, so, so one property, so one thing you want in a distance is to have these nice properties, and these will, these not only kind of make sense, but they also be useful in, in algorithms, um, and. The, the other is that you know it's actually modeling the right thing about your data. You've converted it into some, maybe you've converted your data into one of these vectors somehow, and now you want to say the distance between them. And uh, there are lots of ways to say the distance between these, um, in between on um, two vectors. So let me just formalize this, this discussion here a little bit. Um, if you have the LP distance between 
two vectors. Um, so say A and B are, are vectors, where in, in general we'll say A equals A1, A2, up to A, D. And if this is the case, then I'll generally say that it's an element in, in RD. Um, this usually means that these can take any value in between minus infinity and infinity. Um, sometimes that's restricted to, I'll say all positive numbers, but it's easier just, just to say that. So if I look at the LP distance between these two things, um, then this is often written as A minus B with the norm P, um, then it's going to be the sum I equals 1 to D of AI minus BI to the power P, and then I'm going to take everything to the P root. So this is a general class of, of distances, and all of these are metrics. So, and then what we looked at a special case of this, the L2 distance, right? The, your question? But the, the, um, the L2 distance is, is um, so is often written as just, just the norm of these two. If you drop the norm, you usually assume it's the L2 distance, right? And this is exactly this formula up here, where, let's see, I'm going to take, squared, and then this is the square root. So this is known as the um, Euclidean distance because um, it's, it's the straight line distance. And as I said, it's the only distance where if you changed what the axes were, if you kind of rotated these axes so that these were still the same points, but this was the x-axis and this was the y-axis, then this distance is the same. Any other one of these LP distances does not have this property. So this is on um, um, rotation invariant, which is which is you know a very useful problem. Um, so let me just mention some of the other ones. The the um, the L one distance um, between A and B. Is, is then it's so actually I, I kind of lied here a little bit you actually want to take the absolute value of these things here so then this is, is going to be just the, the sum i equals 1 to d over the absolute value of a minus b so if you don't take the absolute value here, you just take this to the power of 1, this difference, you can get some things which are negative, which would be too weird, right? So when you take the squared, it's automatically kind of taking the absolute value for you. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, the Euclidean distance has a simple way to, um, in order to have uh, a uh, locality sensitive hash function, right? Where I drew this, you can take this random um, unit vector, project the objects onto the random unit vector, see if they fall, then draw some bins in the random unit vector, and if they fall in the same bin, then you say that they hash together. So there's a simple way to do this for the L2 distance with the random unit vector. It turns out with the L1 distance, it is also L is hable. And it uses something instead of instead of a Gaussian for to get the random unit vector here. I needed a um, Gaussian random variable. Here I need a um, 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 Cauchy random variable instead. Um, with you know um, with the Cauchy random. Variable. So it uses the same trick as before. You create um, d of these now Cauchy random variables. Um, and then you normalize these, and you project the point onto these, and then you put bins of size the threshold you want, and, and this works as a hash function. The difference is the Cauchy, unlike the Gaussian, is 
um, is, is not rotation invariant, right? Only the L2 was rotation invariant. Um, and the Cauchy is like a, is kind of like the L1 version of the Gaussian, right? So the, 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 the Cauchy distribution is, um, is A minus B. Um, so is, is, is the, is the one, is the one norm of, a, of two vectors A and B e to that, where the Gaussian was was this. Well, actually, it's the norm of this, where the Gaussian was this norm squared. So, so this is the Cauchy. Um, um, the Gaussian is basically this is the Gaussian distribution essentially. So. Um, so I'm not going to go into much detail, but if you know what, the, what a Gaussian distribution is, and the Cauchy is very similar to this, and this this is kind of properly biased along the axes more, um, because as you see, if you're further out along this way, um, actually maybe this is a good time for a picture, right? Um, so there's this cool way of thinking about these different LP distributions. Um, Let's see, so if you draw a, um, a unit ball around zero, so this is zero, zero here, and I'm gonna draw all the points which are within a distance one of zero, zero under the L2 distance, right? So one point I know which is distance one is the point that is one, zero, another one is 0, 1. We also have minus 1, 0, and 0, minus 1. So now, let's see, if I'm very lucky, I'm going to draw a circle. Let's see how well I do. It's pretty good. Pretty happy. <laughs> it's not perfect, but um, you can kind of imagine L2 is is it's this disk, right? Everything with inside the circle is within a distance one of of this of this point zero, right? So under the L1 distance, looks like this. What does the unit ball look like? What does the unit, you know, everything within a distance one of the L2 distance look like? So it's is this point going to be inside? So like a square or um, this could look like a diamond. Right, so this is another easy this one is easier to draw, although that failed. Okay. So you should go through this. So it's it's still these points are still in, but but otherwise, you know, it's the sum of these two distances, of the x distance and the y distance. So you have to have so the sum is, is equal, and this gives you this this uh, uh, of this thing shaped like a diamond. This is the unit ball under the L1 distance. So you can see, so I was I'm mentioning that the L1 distance is not, uh, uh, um, <coughs> is not um, rotation invariant, right? So if I rotated the space, the corners of the diamond are, are gonna be turning here, right? And so, um, so, you know, as you rotate it, it doesn't, the same points don't stay within a distance one. And so every other distance is going to change as well under this weird skew under rotation. Um, and this Cauchy will bias towards the, uh, your distribution towards these axes more when you're generating these random variables. Um, so, so but, but there is still a way to, this, to, to do this LSH as, as there was before. In fact, there's a whole notion of these p-stable distributions, where the most famous ones are the Gaussian and the Cauchy, um, which work for any for any p. This is in family of p-stable uh, distributions for um, for p in zero. To two, I think. Um, and so, for any 
LP distance between zero but not including zero and up to two, um, then there's a, there's some distribution which looks kind of like this that you can generate a random variable from in some way that um, um, that you can then do some version of this LSH. So then you can you can find all the nearest neighbors under this distance quickly. It's just a matter of changing this p in this in this, um, in this distribution step. Okay, so this is the L1 distance, um, and when we talk about uh, regression, we'll actually look at this this diagram again, and we'll see why the L1 distance is actually, in some sense, can be more stable than the L2 distance. There are some um, tricks where you, um, where you minimize the L1 distance instead of the L2 and you're automatically regularizing the, the solution you have. It means it's more stable to um, okay. So there's, there's something else called the L infinity distance. Um, and so if I So L infinity. So, so what happens if I plug infinity in here for P? It's the what? Uh, the biggest, and biggest difference between AI and the PI dominates the distance. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, that's right, yeah. So there's this weird kind of thing that happens. Um, So the L infinity distance, think of having P set to infinity here. P is in the What? What's the definition of P stable? Uh, P is stable. Oh, P is stable. Um, uh, I did not define it. Uh, okay. Let me see if I have it in my notes. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it is here. I'll try and. I'll try and look it up and, and post it online um, on the notes. I, I don't have the definition written down. It's, it's a little, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit technical. So, um, so there's, there's a whole theory of how to use them, but it's not, um, I, don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. So, yeah. so okay, so if you look at this L infinity distance, if you take this to the infinity, and then you are doing one over infinity, these kind of cancel out for any one term. Um, but what happens is if you have two things, say uh, one thing is value 10, the other is value 20, the one that's value 20, when you take it to the p power where p is really large, is going to be so much bigger than the thing of value 10. And it turns out as you take p to the limit, what happens is that it's only the maximum it's only the maximum term which, uh, which matters. Um, so, um, okay. So, so, so let's go look at this at this this diagram again. What does the L infinity distance look like? Yeah. So this is going to be the square, right? So it's only the maximum thing that matters. This is the L infinity. So if the x value is 1 and the y value is still 0, well, only the x values matter. So if I increase the y value even up to 0.99, whatever, it's still the x value which is dominating the cost. Right, so, so again, you can see that the L infinity distance also is not rotation invariant. As you rotate it, you know, it's still going to change what the distances are. Um, and one, the other cool thing is that if you look, the L infinity and the L1 distance are actually just one is rotated and scaled of the other one, right? So if you have an algorithm which works for L1 distance, you can probably, most likely, you can get it to work for L infinity distance too. It's just a rotation of your of your of your data and then scaling by a little bit, 
and it's geometrically these distances basically look the same. So, so anything you can do for L1 distance, you can also do for L infinity. Um, but as I was mentioning, the, the L infinity distances. So, so maybe here's the intuition why the L2 distance is less robust than the L1 distance. What it's saying here is that this only depends on one coordinate. So if you're in a really high dimensional space, you may have, you, you think of, you're, you're taking a bunch of, of measurements of something, and each of these is a coordinate. And if one of your measurements is noisy, and that one happens to have some large value because you had an error in measuring it, the L infinity distance is going to say, um, this one is pretty, this one is all that matters. Even if everything else is small, I don't care. This largest one measurement you did is, is going to determine what the distance is. It's, so it's much less stable. And, and then as you get down to L2, you're, you're still waiting this longer distance more. You're squaring it, which means it's, it's worth more than a smaller distance. Um, but it's not quite as bad as the, as the L infinity. And the L1 treats them, you know, treats them equally. All the distances, all the coordinates are the same weight. Even if one's further than the other, it still has the same weight. It's if you move it a little bit more in that direction, it's going to increase. You know, the distance is going to increase linearly um, as you do that. Where here it increases, um, you know, it, um, it increases here in a way that's more than um, linear. If it's a far, if it's a far direction, it's a far coordinate, increasing that coordinate more is going to have more of an effect than increasing a small coordinate because you're, because you're squaring it. Um, yeah. So if, if, you, if we can do these L1, L2, and L infinity, then the other thing that kind of makes sense is the L0 distance. So how would I define the L0 distance? So what, what happens if I take something to the power of 0? Unless? Well, OK. So it depends how you define it. 